Funding for NJ Spotlight News provided by the members of the New Jersey Education Association, making public schools great for every child. RWJ Barnabas Health, let's be healthy together. And Orsted, committed to the creation of a new long-term, sustainable, clean energy future for New Jersey. From NJPBS, this is NJ Spotlight News with Brianna Venosi. Good evening and thanks for joining us on this Tuesday night. I'm Brianna Venosi. We begin with bombshell testimony today on Capitol Hill to the House Select Committee investigating the January 6th insurrection. Cassidy Hutchinson, a top aide to former White House Chief of Staff Mark Meadows, gave a first-hand account of the events leading up to and on the ground that day, testifying that the White House knew violence might erupt at the Capitol days before the riot, including that supporters trying to attend the Trump rally were carrying weapons and wearing body armor, adding evidence that those closest to the former president believed he had the power to stop the violence in real time, but that Trump, quote, didn't have a problem with armed supporters attending his event, and instead, urged the Secret Service to remove metal detectors, or MAGs, at the rally. I was, in the, I was in the vicinity of a conversation where I overheard the president say something to the effect of, you know, I, I don't effing care that they have weapons. They're not here to hurt me. Take the effing MAGs away. Let my people in. They can march to the Capitol from here. Let the people in. Take the effing MAGs away. Hutchinson went on to detail accounts where the former president appeared unhinged, including ordering his Secret Service detail to take him to Capitol Hill after giving a speech. When the driver refused, citing safety concerns, Trump lunged at him, grabbed his neck, and attempted to grab the steering wheel, becoming, quote, irate at his detail, screaming, quote, I'm the effing president, take me to the Capitol now. Perhaps one of the most damning pieces of testimony, Donald Trump's reaction when rioters began chanting about the former vice president, calling to, quote, hang Mike Pence. I remember Pat saying something to the effect of, Mark, we need to do something more. They're literally calling for the vice president to be effing hung. And Mark had responded something to the effect of, you heard him, Pat. He thinks Mike deserves it. He doesn't think they're doing anything wrong. Pat is Pat Cipollone, who served as White House counsel for President Trump and was among those warning the president the march on the Capitol could lead to criminal charges brought against him, but that Trump was determined to be part of the rally in some fashion. The House panel can't bring legal charges against the former president, but is unearthing the full scope of his attempt to block the transfer of power and to overturn the 2020 election. The polls continue making it clear a majority of Americans disagree with the Supreme Court's decision overturning Roe v. Wade, ending the constitutional right to abortion. A Monmouth University poll out today finds 60 percent of those surveyed disapprove of the ruling, while 37 percent approve, giving states the power to instead decide abortion laws. And Americans' views of abortion access remained steady since Friday's landmark decision, with 60 66 percent in support of keeping the procedure legal, either always or with some limitations. For states like New Jersey, where abortion remains legal, providers are facing increased security concerns brought on by anti-abortion groups who are targeting clinics and the patients they serve. Senior correspondent Brenda Flanagan reports. How are you going to run away? From God. Every Saturday, anti-abortion protesters preach to clients and carry signs outside Metropolitan Medical Associates in Englewood. Volunteers in pink vests who escort patients past this gauntlet say it's harrowing. You will not run away. You will not escape. Like walking through a little bit of a war zone, you know. Um, there's all these people shouting and screaming. And I know I've had people cry on my shoulder, you know, as they're trying to walk into the door. 
Um, so those are the times when, um, you know, emotionally it feels really difficult. Christine Taylor's co-chair of the clinic's volunteer escort group. She says the recent Supreme Court ruling definitely increased security concerns, not just here, but at New Jersey's 70-odd other abortion providers. Metropolitan reached out to local police and the Bergen County Sheriff. Volunteers are organizing safety protocols, mindful of past violence against abortion clinics elsewhere. You know, what do you do if somebody drove past and started shooting at the building? You know, like we, we have not talked about those things yet. So those are the things that we're, we're considering just kind of nailing down some safety protocol. Even though this decision just came down on Friday, patient safety and security has always been top of mind for Planned Parenthood, and that doesn't change in this moment. I am really worried about what safety will look like now that Rose overturned, that I'm worried that people will feel indignified to take violent action when they may not, they may not have before. Um, I hope that's not the case, but I'd rather us be ready and be protected. Dr. Kristen Brandy says she's concerned about her patients and clinic staff. Even before the Roe ruling, the National Abortion Federation reported skyrocketing violence at clinics. Assaults rose from 15 in 2018 to 123 last year nationwide. Bomb threats soared 80 percent. Stalking spiked 600 percent since 2020. Roxanne Sataki from the Women's Center in Cherry Hill says, she's gotten mailed threats at home and that protesters video clients and clinicians and now she fears it could get worse. They're increasingly um, aggressive. They're coming out in bigger numbers and right now they are celebrating a victory and I think having that affirmation um, of their work from our country's highest court, uh, we're going to continue to see more people come out. She's asked Trenton lawmakers to pass bills that legally shield Jersey providers from anti-abortion states that might prosecute them, and Sataki supports a $5 million reproductive security grant in New Jersey's Law and Public Safety Department's budget to fund items like surveillance cameras. She suspects protesters will now travel here, just like clients, from states that ban abortion. These, you know, legislation aimed at protecting abortion providers for us right now feels like putting the oxygen mask on, right, so that we can help others in this moment of crisis. Um, but we do have a lot of protesters who like literally chase people, you know, on the sidewalk. So I, I would imagine as a patient that that's like super scary when you've got somebody like breathing down your neck. Christine Taylor fears Metropolitan might lose an eight-foot buffer zone Engel would impose to clear a safe path for clients. It's now facing a free speech court challenge. Taylor's escorted folks without that buffer. A disaster. So there were protesters who were following patients practically in the door. Like there would be this whole crowd like on the steps They'd be right at, you know, the patient's backs. It was, it was, a, it was a nightmare. The case is scheduled to be heard this summer. I'm Brenda Flanagan, NJ Spotlight News. In true Trenton fashion, a state budget deal was struck Monday night behind closed doors, and lawmakers voted on it, a whopping $50.6 billion, less than 30 minutes after it was revealed to the legislature for the first time. Frustrating members, particularly Republicans, who say the process lacked transparency. And as is typical of budget negotiations, most of the finishing touches were decided by three Democrats, Governor Murphy, Senate President Nick Scutari, and Assembly Speaker Craig Coughlin, who agreed on money for Governor Murphy's anchor property tax relief program, making a full state worker pension contribution and the largest surplus in the state's history. Budget and finance writer John Reitmeyer was at the state house for the late night vote and is back at it, joining us from Trenton today. John, no rest for the weary. Uh, this is the first time a budget's reached over $50 billion. What's in it? Yeah, that's right, Brianna. And you know, there's been a big surge in revenue in the last few months, and it's really put New Jersey in this position to be able to afford a lot of the things that it's been unable to do in the past, like boosting up that surplus to a record amount. Still that record uh, pension contribution carried over from last year, so the second straight year of the state's really paid all of its bills when it comes to obligations to the pension system. The big beef up in funding for direct property tax relief benefits that people will get in the spring of 2023, 
There's a, a sales tax holiday coming later this summer for uh, some school back to school items. Keeping on the schools topic, there's, you know, we included in this budget from the beginning has been the, mo the, the biggest contribution ever to K through 12 uh, public schools in New Jersey. And so that's carried through, uh, you know, across the board, um, many items that have been neglected over the years are getting funded um, across a lot of different departments this year. You mentioned property tax relief. It's about $2 billion uh, set aside for that. What about the proposal from the GOP? It was $4 billion uh, appropriated. What happened with that? Yeah, the, there were attempts by Republicans to get some of their own uh, ideas when it comes to tax relief into the spending bill. Those were all rebuffed by majority. Democrats hold a majority in both houses, and those were all rebuffed. I, I think Democrat, uh, Republicans did reluctantly at times vote for some of the individual tax breaks. Um, you know, there are some state park fees that are being waived, motor vehicle fees, marriage license fees as part of the, the majority Democrat budget. And so, um, you know, Republicans didn't get what they were looking for, but I think reluctantly went along with some of the tax breaks that um, were authored by Democrats. Uh, were there last minute add-ons, so-called Christmas trees? There typically are uh, when we see something fast-tracked like this. Yeah, there sure were. And with all of the money that's been around, you know, that the state's been collecting over the last few months, you know, I think lawmakers had a little more elbow room to fund what they call their legislative priorities. A lot of parks um, and different projects, museum funding in, in different um, legislative districts throughout the state. And we're still going through the list, you know, dozens of items, um, you know, and, and I, I think some of the questions about this is, is whether or not they have merit is one question, but these will be funded by taxpayers across the state. John, I mean, the state also had a pretty large sum of federal COVID money to use. Where is that being directed? Yeah, that's a really good question. So, uh, you know, a little over $2 billion in the, the slice of uh, federal COVID relief money that New Jersey received is being appropriated kind of alongside the new budget. And so when you think about that 50 plus billion in spending, you, you know, you would really add almost two and a half billion more to that as they appropriate some of this federal money for things like water infrastructure projects. Um, there's a there's a long list, um, lead paint remediation, uh, mater child and maternal health uh, centers. There's a long list of uh, federal, appro you know, the appropriation of federal dollars, but through the governor and the legislature. And they also wrote language that determines the oversight of that spending. That was, if you remember, was a, a, a key uh, hiccup through the budget approval process that came up during the, the committee hearings earlier this year, where the Senate president was seeking language to, that was in the last year's budget to be restored. And they went a little further in terms of what they set up for oversight. Tomorrow, both chambers are slated to take a full vote. Governor Murphy is expected to sign this Thursday before that constituted deadline of uh, midnight, uh, June 30th. We know you will be there for all of it. John Reitmeyer, thank you. You're welcome. A packed legislative session doesn't even begin to describe the scene in Trenton. Lawmakers Monday also pushed through dozens of other bills, more than 70 items in the Senate Budget Committee alone. Worth mentioning, there's help for small businesses that'll need to start making higher unemployment insurance contributions, though the fate of that is unknown. Legislation to make permanent extended summer working hours for teens. 16 to 18 year olds will be able to work up to 50 hours per week. Kids 14 to 15 years old, up to 40 hours in a non-school week. Approval of a state-level child tax credit, giving residents up to $500 per child under the age of six, depending on income. $6 million set aside for New Jersey's new licensing program for law enforcement officers. Changes to that controversial Liberty State Park bill that provides slightly more protection against privatization and money for the school funding formula. Those bills were also on the receiving end of bipartisan criticism over a rushed process. The money is not flowing for New Jersey City University. In our Spotlight on Business report, the school, which is a funder of NJ Spotlight News and NJ Business Beat, is facing tumultuous times, asking the state for $10 million to help keep the doors open. The board chairman declaring a financial emergency 
Adding insult to injury, the Jersey City College's president, Sue Henderson, announced she's stepping down after a decade at the helm and called the fiscal challenges a result of the state's, quote, historical underinvestment in the university and in black and brown communities. But there's also been a decline in enrollment at the school and among all college-age students nationwide since the start of the pandemic. The university's board adopted an interim budget Monday, giving the school 90 days to find solutions. Jason Kroll, NJCU's vice president, has been named acting president. Turning now to the stock market, here's a look at today's trading numbers following attempts to hold on to a rebound. It's been a chaotic time for airline passengers. Nearly a thousand flights canceled yesterday across the U.S. and hundreds more today, marking a week of mass cancellations. It's testing the patience of thousands of weary travelers who are up against an air system that just can't seem to keep up with the boom due to pent up pandemic demand and critical staffing shortages. None of it bodes well for the looming July 4th holiday weekend. Joanna Gagas has the story. Looking at the flight board today, it looked like smooth sailing at Newark Airport. We're going to Kalamazoo, so we have a layover in Detroit. And so far, so good. Um, no cancellation, so fingers crossed. So far, we're on, everything's on, running on time right now. But look a little closer and you'll see the weary faces of travelers who've run the gauntlet to get where they need to go today after massive flight cancellations across the country yesterday. Yesterday, we had to leave at 4 a.m. And then we were in the Uber on our way to um, the airport and we realized it was canceled and we had already checked out of our hotel. So we had to go back, get a new hotel and it was all like at 6 a.m., 8 a.m. And now we rebooked for the next day and we're we drove to here to fly back to Detroit. This group was stuck in Orlando trying to get back to Philly. Yesterday our flight was canceled three or four different times. Um, we waited in line for, for three hours three hours. Um, they did um, give us like a voucher for a hotel and then vouchers to get transportation back and forth but that was kind of iffy too. We didn't know if we were going to get something to get back to the um, airport this morning um, and then we, we had, had a different flight, um, different airline and that was smooth sailing all the way through but we're from Philly so now we have to drive to Philly. They're happy to at least be close to home after the madness of what they've just lived through. It was insane. People screaming at one another in line, people sleeping on the floors. It was a lot. Little kids. Baby Little screaming. Kids. So what's behind the delays that saw more than 850 flights canceled across the country on Sunday and another 950 or so canceled yesterday? Henry Hardeveld says it's an airline system that's stretched to the breaking point. Airlines don't have enough employees at airports, in their reservation centers, pilots, flight attendants, and almost every role at the airline is understaffed. He says the FAA is also feeling the effects of limited staff after workers left during COVID. The FAA is also working to hire and train more air traffic controllers, but that takes time. They're understaffed. It's like the airlines are trying to cram 10 pounds of flying into eight pound bags. If something goes wrong, it bursts. He says it'll take several months to complete the training of new staff and get them working. In the meantime, airlines are asking customers to help out, but not everyone's willing to lend a helping ticket. They asked me if I want to volunteer to not go or reschedule this flight or the next one that I'm on. And uh, I wasn't so interested. You said no. No, I said no. Hardeveld's advice, if you're the one stuck without a seat, have a backup plan ready in case your flight is delayed or canceled. Advice that would have helped these travelers whose plane had mechanical issues today. It is stressful because we were really hoping to get back home because we, we have our dog waiting for us also back at home. So we have like my dad has to go back to work tomorrow as well. So it's kind of stressful, like not knowing what to do, it's kind of sitting around. 
Were you anticipating that this might be a problem just seeing what was happening at the airport? We were joking about it, but we didn't think it was actually going to happen. So overall, a much calmer day here at Newark Airport, but with a busy holiday weekend coming up, it could be deja vu all over again with flights grounded and passengers wondering when they'll get to their destination. In Newark Airport, I'm Joanna Gagas, NJ Spotlight News. The Senate Judiciary Committee Monday made steps toward chipping away at the state's dire shortage of superior court judges, approving seven of Governor Murphy's judicial nominees, who will now go on for a full vote in the Senate tomorrow. The judicial shortage has worsened a backlog of cases that began during pandemic shutdowns and grew so severe some counties suspended certain types of trials altogether. If approved, the nominees will be among the most diverse on a bench that's filled predominantly by white males. Finally tonight, honoring Black Music Month. The Grammy Museum experience at the Prudential Center is opening a new exhibit looking at five decades of hip-hop music and the culture it created, featuring the work of a photographer who captured rare and intimate moments of some of the biggest hip-hop stars. Melissa Rose Cooper has the story. I think the inspiration started by accident, like most things do. I was fascinated by that street energy, and it drew me in, and almost instantly, I met everyone, bonded with everyone, everybody, you know, and uh, the rest is history. And this is when it was raw and organic, and the mainstream had not heard of, and hip hop, and if they did, they didn't want to share it with nobody. But it's something photographer Ernie Panicoli has been sharing for as long as he can remember. A photographic look at hip-hop artists throughout history. And now his work is being showcased in a new exhibit at the Grammy Museum Experience Prudential Center called A Hip-Hop Life. Five decades of hip-hop, music, art, and culture. If you look at hip-hop and where it came from, it came from people like Nina Simone, Gil Scott Heron, the rhythms of John Coltrane, the energy of the street, uh, Gil Scott Heron, the last poets, Curtis Mayfield, even Marvin Gaye with what's going on. They were projecting a political awareness, a spiritual awareness, a universal awareness in their music, in their, their vibe. And this spread and mutated into hip hop. The exhibit making its debut a few weeks ago just in time to celebrate Black Music Month. It's amazing that it's been 50 years of hip hop. It's hard to believe that. Mark Conklin is the director for the Grammy Museum Experience Prudential Center. He hopes the hip hop exhibit can teach people of all ages about the impact the genre has had on musical culture, just as other parts of the museum highlight the contributions of Jersey artists. Well, of course, Bruce, we had to have the boss, Whitney, Sissy Houston is, and Dionne Warwick is, naughty by nature. So there's so many artists from New Jersey with so many contributions from so many different genres. I think that's what's most important. It's from rock to pop to R&B and hip hop. So we have it all here in New Jersey. And we were so fortunate to have access to Brother Ernie because normally we do an exhibit. We don't always have, you know, the person here, but he lives here. He's from New Jersey. Well, he's from the Bronx, but he lives in Jersey City. So having access to him and up close and personal is really important, especially for our young people to learn about the history of this music and again, the importance of its impact on culture. So you've been, you know, documenting hip hop since pretty much from, from the start. How does it make you feel now to see all of this from display and be able to share it with other people? I think it's excellent being able to share it with other people. I think it's excellent for people to look back and one day I'm going to do a show which predates this show by 10 or 15 years. This is exciting because it is going to show you or link you to, remember the movie Roots? This is our roots. This is our, this is our rhythm. This is our thing that, that, that moved people around the planet. But this is the home and this is where it should be on at first. You can check out the hip hop exhibit at the Grammy Museum Experience Prudential Center through October 30th. For NJ Spotlight News, I'm Melissa Rose Cooper. And that does it for us this evening. In the meantime, head over to njspotlightnews.org and check us out on all of our social platforms for the latest news on the Garden State. I'm Brianna Venosi For the entire NJ Spotlight News team, thanks for being with us tonight. See you back here tomorrow.
JM Insurance Group, serving the insurance needs of residents and businesses for more than 100 years, and Horizon Blue Cross Blue Shield of New Jersey, an independent licensee of the Blue Cross and Blue Shield Association. Have some water. Look at these kids. How are you? What do you see? I see myself. I became an ESL teacher to give my students what I wanted when I came to this country. The opportunity to learn, to dream, to achieve, a chance to belong and to be an American. My name is Julia Toriani Crompton and I'm proud to be an NJEA member. If you need to see a doctor, RWJ Barnabas Health has two easy ways to do it from anywhere. You can see an urgent care provider 24-7 on any device with our Telemed app. Or use our website to book a virtual visit with an RWJ Barnabas Health Medical Group provider or specialist, even as a new patient. You've taken every precaution, and so have we. So don't delay your care any longer. RWJ Barnabas Health. Let's be healthy together. I'm Miles, and this is what I work for. To be my best for them, and for me, in body and in mind. I need a health insurer that helps me get the care I need for both, that has mental health professionals that I can talk to when I need to, because when I feel strong and secure, so do they. This is my life, and this is how Horizon Blue Cross Blue Shield of New Jersey works for me.